So I'm Ken Sag, Director of the Center of Outcomes Effectiveness Research and Education. It's a great pleasure to welcome all of you and our speakers today to our eighth annual Method Symposia. This is an event that we always look forward to each year to bring in some visitors to hear about some topics. And it's been really helpful over the years to get feedback from all of you. And at the end of this, we'll want to solicit your input on, on future topics. Uh, I want to first acknowledge our sponsors, which include our Outcome Center and several other entities, including the School of Medicine AMC 21 initiative. And we've been doing this for a few years. Here are some of the topics that we've covered. You can see that in 2014, we actually had a similar topic on health systems interventions and it was so popular, we decided to focus on that again this year with some, some really terrific uh, speakers and some very timely topics. And so I think as we look at what we're going to hear about today and, and get it introduced to these um, uh, different uh, topics, it's important to put it into the context of the learning healthcare system. This is what the Institute of Medicine now, the National Academy of Medicine, has coined as the opportunity for a routine clinical encounter to generate research-grade data. And how can we turn our healthcare systems into research environments. And it, I find this particularly interesting that there's actually some ethical underpinnings for this. Uh, uh, Ruth Cass and um, her colleagues at, at Hopkins have suggested that both for healthcare professionals and institutions, we have a moral priority. And it's a similar obligation for our patients to participate based on the principle of common good. So the obligation to address Unjust inequalities, the learning healthcare system must decrease inequalities in an evidence-based way for clinical decision-making. So as we hear the talks today, we want to think about this framework and consider how we can actualize some of this within our own healthcare system. So if you haven't seen already, we've got a, a very abundant supply of food and coffee. Please uh, help yourself. We'll take a break in the middle, but uh, if you need to get up, there's uh, refreshments around the corner. CME is available for those that are interested. As usual, please silence your phones. Restrooms around the corner. And at the conclusion of this, the presentations will be available for you online. So we'll put up the agenda and uh, just show you what we're going to do today. We'll start off with uh, Adrian Hernandez, followed by uh, Paul Harris, Amy Kilborn from the University of Michigan, and then our very own uh, Mike Mugavero. We'll talk about healthcare access and we'll, we'll finish up a little bit before noon. And we should have time at the end of each speaker's presentation for plenty of discussion. Great, so without further ado, let me introduce uh, Jeff Curtis, who will welcome our first speaker. Well, good morning. It's certainly a delight to be with you and to introduce Dr. Adrian Hernandez. So Dr. Hernandez is a cardiologist at Duke, and he's the associate director of the Duke Clinical Research Institute, really one of the, the preeminent clinical research centers in the United States, focused not just on cardiology, but on a lot of other endeavors across different disciplines. He leads a number of different collaboratories and large networks. We're going to hear, I think, about at least one of those today, including the NIH collaboratory, as well as as PCORNET, one of the major investments that the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute has made, really trying to improve population health, quality improvement, to do interventional and observational studies to improve the health of patients, and really address questions that both clinicians and patients would highly value. So with that, thank you very much for being able to visit us today. All right. <clears throat> Great. Uh, thanks. Uh, is this uh, working? Okay. Online the recording. okay, all right, just want to make sure since uh, I know you were doing some uh, technical uh, changes here. So uh, thanks for having me. Uh, just uh, I do have a few uh, disclosures. Um, one is uh, my mother's family's from Alabama. Uh, and so I appreciate boiled peanuts. I spent many summers here, uh, my grandparents uh, in a place called Abbeville, Alabama. Uh, anyone know where Abbeville is? Okay. All right. Well, we have a winner. Uh, congratulations. So, uh, Abbeville is in, the, in Henry County, uh, which is uh, uh, just north of Dothan, Alabama. Uh, so, I think people know where Dothan, Alabama. My guess is there have been people 
that have come all the way from Dothan to, to UAB uh, for their care. And I'm pretty sure that um, there, my family members have actually come here. I know that for a fact uh, here. So it's always gr uh, great to be back in Alabama. <clears throat> Whenever I come here for anything, uh, one of the questions that I get from my uh, mother and relatives is that, am I actually gonna come here uh, uh, permanently? But uh, anyway, uh, it's always fun to uh, come visit. And so uh, for the next 40 minutes, I wanna share with you uh, what we've been working on over the last few years uh, regarding uh, PCORnet and hopefully uh, get you all excited about how you could actually join. Uh, so in different ways, you're part of it in some ways, um, but we're actually trying to create a pathway for uh, this to be really a national evidence generation system that uh, multiple people can join, multiple systems and organizations uh, can join. Uh, these are actually my real disclosures. We work with a lot of different people. And so uh, over the next 40 minutes, I just want to go through uh, a few key topics. Uh, one is the why. Uh, why, why was this actually done? Uh, the how, uh, how was it actually translating uh, the vision to reality? Um, and then the what of uh, what's actually happening now and then actually uh, show uh, what's, uh, what the doing is, meaning actually doing research. Um, so instead of being a slideshow, actually showing that we're actually starting to generate answers and then also end uh, with uh, what's uh, next. So, um, but, but first I just wanna uh, share a, a story and um, it's uh, quite interesting. So uh, I know there are a lot of people here who uh, dedicated health services research. Uh, when I was kind of uh, growing up um, in, in the kind of training and then trying to explain to my parents, you know, that I wasn't gonna go back home to Port Arthur, Texas and, and practice with my father that I had this idea that I actually wanted to do research uh, they didn't understand what that meant. Um, but eventually they um, I got to, okay, well, this sounds like a, a, a potentially good idea, um, but are you gonna be able to care for you and your family? <clears throat> and then um, after you know, years of training, uh, my, I got this uh, note uh, from my mother uh, that she saw a, a story in the local paper. And it turned out that the local paper um, had picked up uh, an article that we had published in JAMA about ventricular assist devices. And, um, and essentially at the time, ventricular assist devices were uh, used for heart failure, um, but the technology was still evolving. And so based on the outcomes there for these um, big devices then, uh, they weren't what we wanted. And they certainly, they certainly weren't as, uh, as uh, inexpensive as everyone will want. And the, the basic story was that, you know, we have more work to do and we need to continue to measure this and actually in order to, to share um, with the community where we want to go and how to get there, but also showing that we're not there yet on outcomes and we're not there yet on cost. And uh, she had been diagnosed with coronary disease and essentially she asked me if I knew what I was doing. Uh, that, uh, that she had early coronary disease, that she actually may need one of these devices, that she understood from the news and the newspapers that these were life-saving uh, devices and that, that my uh, article, uh, my uh, manuscript was essentially threatening that. And so, and, then, and she had picked up, picked up the article as well in the New York Times and Wall Street Journal. And so I went through and explained to her, you know, the quality improvement cycle, you gotta share what you uh, have there. And um, so anyway, we, we got over that. And then um, a, a few years uh, later, um, you know, she had uh, moved to um, Durham um, because of uh, four things. Initially, there were only two. We had twin boys, and so she was helping uh, those out. And so she'd get approached with uh, research ideas uh, because she's part of Duke Health System. And so occasionally she would get contacted. And, and then um, uh, one day she asked, uh, well, I, I got this um, approach for doing this study, and um, it's about um, aspirin dosing. And I understand that uh, you guys don't know in cardiology uh, at Duke how to dose aspirin. <laughs> and, uh, and so she, she's like, starts going through this with me that, you know, how many years that she spent um, money on med school, how she supported me uh, through residency in San Francisco, which was expensive. And uh, I was not uh, living within my means uh, with the UCSF uh, salary. 
And then I continue to go on to, to Duke and do all this time there and, and get extra training as well. And, and it was beyond her that we didn't even know the right dose of aspirin. <laughs> and so, uh, and so anyway, uh, kind of went through the process there. But, um, but her points on both those things were, um, she actually wants answers uh, now. She actually actually expects that we would have known what we need to do for advancing treatment for heart failure and ventricular assist devices. That we actually would have a, a continuous process that would actually assess this. That it wouldn't have to take so many years um, to develop it. And she was just shocked also that we didn't know answers to questions that have been therapies that have been around for decades. And she was shocked that with all the training that I had, that I didn't know the simplest answers. So, um, so anyway, I'll, I'll continue that story, um, but uh, as we go along, um, but one of the things that came up in, in discussing this is that, well, you know, here I asked her, well, here's your chance to help us answer this. And there's a study that I'll talk about later that you could join to help you and others actually find out what the right answer. The thing that she was really worried about was um, these little creatures here um, uh, called grandsons. And, and so uh, she does a lot with our four boys helping out after school. And she was worried about what she would be required to go and do uh, for a study. That you know, she was okay, like if it was convenient that uh, she didn't have to go into the, the hospital or a clinic very often. Um, but um, she was really worried about like, how could she do that? But then on the flip side, she wants to live a very long time because she does have a great time with her boys. And um, we also uh, really depend on her. So, so fundamentally though, like she was, you know, um, couldn't believe that it takes so long, you know, to go from this type of device uh, and over the years and how we're not learning all the time. And then also like the simple questions of aspirin that we're not continuously addressing those questions for her and others. Her, her expectation actually was that we're always learning. And so, um, but that's uh, kind of fallen short. So, uh, and that's the point you heard Ken just talking about that there is this vision that's been laid out actually many years ago now is how can you learn um, from each other every day? And actually as patients are walking through the health systems, how are we actually um, uh, learning from them and sharing their experiences for others so we're always better for the next uh, group of uh, patients. And uh, this has really come up even uh, bigger. Um, this is something that uh, Mike Lauer uh, pointed out to me, uh, who's head of extramural funding, is that uh, uh, several years ago, uh, the labor department uh, was looking at the biomedical uh, uh, R&D area and noted that this was a pretty important growth area. And so what they noted was actually these uh, curves uh, going up um, here, um, that the mean total grant cost per patient was going up. And so uh, the labor department was essentially looking at as a good thing, that this is um, you know, gonna be a growing labor pool and that that would be important. Well, actually it's the opposite. It actually means that we're like completely inefficient, that like you know, compared to the biomedical R&D price index, it's taken more and more to get the same thing out. And so that's a problem. And so when you see um, NIH saying that, that like they want essentially, uh, they're not gonna take this on uh, anymore in terms of allowing this to continue. And you see that across industry, something has to change. And uh, you know, the last few weeks have been, the NIH's budget's been in the news. Um, it's pretty incredible that that, uh, that uh, we are arguing about our future in terms of the national investment uh, that has really allowed uh, the U.S. to lead in many ways, not only economically, but also in terms of innovations uh, for the world and, and, and locally. Uh, and the NIH budget has been flat. I've asked different people around um, how they feel in terms of the, are they overflowing with NIH dollars? And you always get the same answer, uh, which is uh, chuckles and no. Uh, so and that's reflected here. And, and even though like in, you we're on a personal mission about health services research, <coughs> that's something that can have the immediate impact right now um, that we actually don't invest like we should. If this was um, a different organization, you would do that. 
But you know, part of the um, issue is um, how do we actually get results? And so, and people who are so, who are oriented to quality improvement, that's really clear to everyone. Well, now funders are actually getting big pressure on doing that. Uh, a couple of outsiders have noted that, well, shouldn't we turn the scientific method on ourselves? Actually, how do we actually measure the return investment for the dollars that are spent at NIH? How do institutions do that uh, as well? Uh, this book came out uh, a few uh, weeks ago, uh, Rigor Mortis, and it actually uh, uh, is very interesting in highlighting um, how systematically uh, we have issues. Uh, that the incentive structure is so much aligned towards individual success, you're trying to create results that are hard to reproduce. And that's from fundamental basic science to um, the full spectrum. And so an example is uh, two cases where uh, two industry leaders actually uh, went to replicate fundamental experiments that led to essentially hundreds of millions or um, even um, several billion dollars uh, for drug development. And they couldn't replicate um, the ex fundamental experiments um, more than 15% uh, of the time. And so I think this is why there's huge attention in getting results now and truly learning as we go. And so, in part, uh, uh, these are reasons why uh, PCORI uh, in 2012 actually brought a group of uh, various stakeholders and said, what can we do to change things? Uh, what would be the national investment to make things different? And uh, they, the various stakeholders basically said our, our research system is fractured. And it's parallel to healthcare and says as fractured as healthcare. And so the answers that we get um, take too long they don't always um, answer the questions that people want, and meaning all people, patients, clinicians, health systems, regulators, payers, uh, and, uh, and even when we do, it's really expensive. Uh, the cost per participant in a clinical trial is incredible, and the time it takes to get answers is also unbelievable. So now transitioning to, well, how do you translate um, uh, what what the problems are into uh, solving it. Um, but CoreNet was uh, created for this. And essentially the vision was, you know, how to bring together large organizations, people, and health systems uh, to have a national system that would enhance uh, clinical research uh, with quality and efficiency. And, uh, and really have a mission to enable people, meaning all people, as I said, to have informed healthcare decisions uh, through clinical research that was relevant. And, uh, and it's, that mission has um, really been focused on developing a functional research network that engages um, people throughout, uh, that creates an infrastructure that's reusable tools and approaches and policies and practices that can be used um, and also iterate over time, evolve um, as a health system and healthcare changes and evolve as explosion of uh, new techniques, new approaches, new methods um, around data science evolve. And then also um, leverage the many data silos that exist and also protect privacy um, that people wanna make sure um, have. Uh, and, and also how to ensure that you have um, essentially a trusting environment that people can join and contribute and actually do everyone else's research. Uh, that's part of the uh, theme for that book, Rigor Mortis, was that we've created a system and incentive structure that people's individual success are actually often higher than the team's success or society's success. And so how do you create uh, a different approach? So uh, this is how it's organized right now. There are 20 um, people-powered research uh, networks that are essentially uh, groups of people organized around typically a theme of health or a condition and uh, 13 clinical data research networks, uh, each of which have to have about a million people uh, at least to get in uh, here, and that becomes uh, PCORnet. But really what PCORnet is is this combination of uh, researchers, patients, clinicians, health systems, and data that's armed uh, to answer these questions. Since I know this is uh, a method symposium, I'll, I'll, I'll spend a few minutes on the data part because people are interested on what's kind of the, the good, the bad, and the ugly around that and how can you harness this. And I think everyone uh, understands that 
you know, underlying all this is, you know, what's behind there and how will it change? And so PCORnet um, is organized around a common data model that was um, uh, created uh, as an offshoot of what was uh, FDA Sentinel program for uh, safety surveillance. Um, but it, it basically pulls in um, areas that are routinely encountered in healthcare across these areas, but then also allows other areas to be added uh, that may be of relevance uh, that uh, for particular populations or different health systems. And for example, uh, genomics is certainly a great interest. And also how do you link different areas such as health plan data as well. And you know, really, if you think about this and say you were given the task, someone came to you, let's say Donald Trump says like, hey, I'm not, I'm not gonna get the wall built. Instead, I want to build a data system that is for all. He's a populist president. I think that would be a populist thing. And so if he came to you, and says, how do you get a research question at hundreds of institutions and get back results you trust? So those are themes that uh, the Donald certainly would put forward. And you have two options that you come up with. you at the edge of chaos, and so you brainstorm here. And option one, we'll write a description, we'll put it on email, we'll have everyone just do it locally and run against their own data. And so then they send the email results back to you. And the question is, do you trust it? Do you know if it's valid? Do you know if there's not a mistake somewhere? How do you know that? Uh, or, or option two is actually create an algorithm that can run against a single common data model that's been curated, that's been characterized in some way that you actually understand that you have some fundamental trust of what that is. So I, I think that's you know been kind of a theme around a lot of different efforts, but really trying to take on option two and doing this in a way that happens. And then, um, now I'm sure um, UAB is perfect um, in terms of how it's organized in healthcare. Uh, and uh, I wish I could say that Duke is uh, perfect, but we have this neighbor uh, called UNC, and, uh, and, and we um, always say that we're perfect in terms of everything that we do, um, except when we get humble uh, in basketball, uh, like this year, um, and then also occasionally in, in healthcare. Uh, when we realize that um, it's complex, um, as, as Donald Trump has said, you know, who would have thought that healthcare is complex? And one of the challenges is that, like, you know, there is data everywhere, and the density and heterogeneity of data is incredible. And so, how can you harness it? Now, like, you could take, you know, many years to try to, you know, pull all this together, or you could start with a basic foundation that can grow as, as you learn. And so, that's been really the approach here. And so it is really starting to standardize the basics, you know, standardize things to a common data model that can be quality uh, checked and characterize and grow. And so building out modules as things go along and then as healthcare organizes in a more efficient process and a standardized process, like then you'll be able to um, add modules as things go along. And so this has been the, the approach uh, here for PCORnet and so like, you know, one of the things that you would think would be pretty easy, like labs, is are pretty hard. Uh, so how many different uh, units for platelets or hemoglobin or hemoglobin A1C? Uh, and that's just in the US. And if you start thinking about global studies, then that's an even bigger challenge. But, but it has been focused on this continuous cycle of data curation. So going through and understanding um, what's there, um, uh, doing uh, characterization to improve that, to make sure that things are standardized. And the other thing that happens as well is that there can be people who change things in the health system that may not necessarily be known to the researchers. And so uh, you can see as data gets characterized over time that there's been some fundamental change that all of a sudden, you know, someone's procedures um, went to zero. Well, that's probably not the case. Uh, uh, and so how you do that? One of the things that's um, uh, a little unique here is that it is based on um, a distributed um, infrastructure in that um, you, you, one way uh, to solve the problem is to just get everyone to send their data. Let's just say that um, you know, we're at the edge of chaos and this is a, the place that's fundamentally going to change things and it's trusted by all partners and so you could just have all data come here. <laughs> well. Uh, my guess is that um, people are going to have 
um, uh, some questions about that. And so that's why um, things have been built so that data stays inside the firewalls and that researchers can come into what we call the front door with a research question that can translate to SAS uh, uh, executable code and that query goes into uh, the data partners uh, and then the aggregated data comes back. So that's one um, uh, key feature here that it can be used. That doesn't mean that's the only thing because certainly with patient consent, you can get um, uh, uh, data come centrally. But the real purpose here is like, how do you start creating reusable tools to query the data? You know, how do you start building modular programs that can be reusable? So when you understand the exposure, when you understand the outcome, and you say like you have a common set of things that you want to do over and over, um, that's really the benefit of having a network that's re reusable. And so starting to think about that, and so then you know, could you actually start just giving the Mad Libs uh, crypt sheet uh, to people and do this? And so that's started. And then really it's a constant learning. So we're talking about learning healthcare system in terms of generating evidence, but actually we need a learning research system. And so that's also implicit uh, here as well. So now just to give uh, some, what, what are the results? Well, uh, the good news is that it turns out there are um, millions of people that walk through the doors of PCORnet. And if you look over the last year, how many people walk through PCORnet doors, um, it's over 40 million. And if you go back several years, then you can add um, another 80 million encounters or so uh, for that. And it represents, generally speaking, what we see in the US. So all ages, you know, diversity across different areas. And, um, and hopefully this can be something where people can start thinking about how could you actually leverage a national system at, at scale to do different things. And just to highlight, I mean, there are, there are populations here that may be of great interest. So like there's a very strong pediatrics interest. And so um, 11 million uh, or so uh, kids uh, there, if you call kids less than 20. Um, uh, the, uh, and then also thinking about older populations as well, so pretty uh, diverse. And this is just an example of um, uh, different conditions that have uh, that you can get counts on uh, of what's there. And so using uh, computable phenotypes or codes that have been used for, say, programs such as Sentinel, but also other programs that have uh, validated uh, computable phenotypes, so codes that are used um, that are part of uh, a routine care, uh, that uh, can have known at least sensitivity and specificity about you know, that a given uh, diagnosis. And so looking at common conditions as well as uh, rare conditions such as ulcerative colitis. And then one of the big things is saying, well, there's gonna be all this lab data. How can you actually translate this into actually information? And uh, you know, there, you know, for specific studies, you say, wow, this is amazing. Um, but you also need to understand what some of this actually really uh, means and so in specific studies like this is where people will focus on in terms of understanding you know how how consistent is the data around uh, certain important lab areas as well but uh, certainly you see a lot of labs now in terms of um, what's happening now like just you know people are really interested in designing studies around the cornet how can you actually leverage this and um, and really is trying to pull all the pieces together and one of the first things that we're really trying to push forward is like actually engagement. Um, shouldn't you ask people um, uh, how they would design a study or be part of a study or participate in a study, you know, whether it's a participant, a study coordinator, or a clinician or a health system? So for example, um, my mother, if she were approached for the aspirin study or adaptable, and they say, okay, we're gonna have you come in um, on every Thursday at uh, two o'clock, to get your medication, there's absolutely no way. But you say, okay, um, we're gonna um, only get your data um, through the internet or by phone call, and we're gonna give you your treatment. Well, then the answer is uh, potentially yes. And then also combining that to what are the things that can be leveraged within Picorna versus other things. You'll hear more about like other incredible tools and approaches for doing other things in terms of extracting electronic health record data, collecting PROs um, directly from participants, putting that on a backbone of a common data model, using those um, for actually generating study data analysis that can be um, reusable, and then feeding back onto the systems to actually change the care. So what if you had a study that you actually were able to tell um, all participants and participants like them 
what the answer was instantaneously. The systems um, should be able to do that. The data is there. In some ways, you could actually argue it's almost unethical that you didn't you allow people to come across the health systems when there are known answers that are better. So um, the, uh, the, the engagement part, I just want to emphasize because it's been a lot of fun working with different groups. And, and one of the things that we have realized is that every time we have put forward a protocol, uh, there hasn't been anything that uh, came out with no changes. Uh, so we've always learned something, and this is uh, one of our partners, uh, Bray Patrick Lake, uh, and you know, essentially um, noted like you know, various things, like how do you get to real people that would uh, be representative of what you encounter, uh, making sure the studies are feasible. Um, but then there's these other things. There's a thing um, between uh, patients and their data, and they're called clinicians. And um, we started recognizing, well, how do you actually integrate things in the workflow? We, we, we're adding more and more burden to clinicians. Um, just fill this out, just check this, it'll take five minutes. And so 20 other people say it just takes five minutes. And so then you see what happens. So really think about how that can uh, change as well. Uh, here's some uh, examples of that for the adaptable study on uh, randomized trial and aspirin we have. Um, what they self-named themselves uh, called the adapters and just wrote a um, perspective piece with uh, one of those, uh, Henry Cruz here. And then we recently um, had pulled this group uh, for a cluster randomized trial uh, called uh, Connect HF. And you notice this guy, he's actually from LA, but he came at the beginning of March Madness. And so he was uh, really motivated uh, about changing the world, uh, including basketball. Uh, uh, so he thought his, his t-shirt was gonna be a uh, priceless at the end of March. Yeah. Um, and, and really start not just thinking about what can be within the core net as kind of a starting thing, so, but also are the things that can actually leverage um, you know, with related items around the core net. So not just thinking within a box, but also thinking outside the so-called the core net box as everything's tied to electronic health records from uh, doing key things in and out uh, here. And so this is something where we're actually, this is a punch list for us um, for PCORnet of how can we continue to grow these different areas. Um, and then just, I wanna um, uh, kind of highlight some uh, case examples. There are 14 PCORi funded PCORnet demonstration projects uh, here uh, across the spectrum, interventional studies, observational studies, um, people-powered uh, research network studies and health system studies, but really gonna just highlight two of those. Uh, so the aspirin study or adaptable, um, this is really asking a question that um, is, uh, if you knew actually the answer of um, whether 81 versus 325 of aspirin uh, mattered, uh, you could potentially um, address uh, 19,000 deaths or heart attacks a year or thousands of bleeds annually in the US. Now that's a simple question. It seems like we should know the answer. And if you start adding decades to that um, uh, question, how many lives have potentially passed? So um, it's organized in really what I call the ultra pragmatic trial. So there's a pragmatic randomized trial and then there's randomized trial. And so this is kind of on the far end of the spectrum, but um, our goal is to electronically identify um, 20, uh, enroll 20,000 participants using PCORnet. So applying uh, computable phenotypes, so codes against data marts across the network, and then electronically approaching those people, having their baseline data come from PCORnet, and then through follow-up mechanisms through either a portal um, that they interact with or by phone if they're not internet savvy, uh, collect patient reported outcomes, medication use, but then also collect outcomes using the PCORnet common data model. As people come back into the health system um, and uh, generate um, encounters you know, using that really to collect their outcome data. And then also tying it to other data sources to have complete uh, data uh, with other pair data. Now you can go and play around uh, adaptablepatient.com to actually experience what it's like. Um, this was co-designed with um, the adapters um, and how this would work and uh, has electronic consent that actually has a comprehension tied to it. And um, to date, um, we're pretty happy with um, progress here. The normal cardiovascular trial enrolls at about one participant per site per month or less. Usually the benchmark is 0.5. Uh, and so 
uh, we can see these different networks that are at different stages in development uh, that you have ranges of enrollment up to um, 48 participants per site per month. Um, I have to give a shout out to Vanderbilt because uh, Vanderbilt just totally rocks here. Uh, they um, have really led the way in terms of doing a multi-pronged approach and lead uh, the efforts for Mid-South. Um, it certainly got Duke's competitive juices going. Uh, and so we're actually uh, trying to catch up to them and it looks like we were, we're constantly uh, trying to catch up to them, but then Vanderbilt had an incredible week last week. So, um, and the one thing that we were using this also as an example, and I think this is how all studies should be, is that not only learn and address a question, but how do we learn how to make the bet next, next study better? And so for a question that's as simple as aspirin, over the counter, you'd be amazed at what the consent originally looked like that people wanted. The template was like 14 pages. We, we actually got it to four and a half pages and co-designed it with uh, participants and met uh, the regulatory requirements with it. And so um, it really went through a multi-stage process and we think we had a, a much better consent process here. And this is something I think we need to take on nationally and use these networks here. And so, you know, for something like that, you know, we wind up having um, a, a lot of different consents. So if you imagine something like that, like you know, we have 30 sites, how many different consents would we have? Well, the answer is uh, 30. That's amazing. That's a quality problem uh, here that I think we need to be uh, addressing. So another example is just on the observational side, uh, there are two questions there. What's the right procedure for obesity and do antibiotics um, and, and childhood contribute to obesity? So two different questions, two different age groups um, uh, here. Uh, one is looking at bariatric surgery procedures to see what has long-term benefits. And then one is like really childhood antibiotic exposure can actually lead to, uh, uh, um, potentially to childhood obesity. So uh, similar to like animal husbandry uh, where uh, how animals get um, plumper is actually having antibiotics in their meals. Uh, and so does that actually happening in the U.S. Uh, with our kids? And so the good news is if you look at data uh, nationally from other sources uh, that you can see PCORnet data essentially mirrors um, some of the uh, procedure types over time. And then when you look at um, key areas that have been unexplored, you can really tap into areas that you would never imagine um, that this was happening. So in bariatric surgery, there are 904 adolescents that have had actually bariatric procedures. I mean, who would have imagined that? So. Uh, and then for the antibiotics, that's you know um, about 380,000 people, kids that will have um, primary outcome data to look at. So these are just examples of what's possible. Now to fi finish up, uh, what's next is that you know, we are really aiming to think about different kinds of research, but ideally we're thinking about like things that can be pragmatic and especially highly pragmatic randomized trials and there are a variety of data sources to do this, but it certainly can be used for um, a variety of observational studies as well as uh, other types of trials. And then as things go forward, um, uh, uh, PCORI um, has wanted um, this to be self-sustaining. And so we recently created uh, this People-Centered Research Foundation, which is hopefully gonna be an, an, a channel for other institutions, organizations to join as well. And so this is uh, where I'm going to put the pitch to you all at UAB um, to hopefully join this foundation as things go forward. Um, and uh, things are still evolving. Uh, this has a mission statement right now to get it incorporated. It doesn't fit on a t-shirt. And so like uh, that'll likely uh, change. Uh, and there's a inaugural board, uh, Rob Califf, uh, former FDA commissioner, as uh, chairing it, but you can see the inaugural board is a representative of different organizations. So NIH, uh, health insurance plans, uh, patient organizations, um, industry as well, and uh, payers. And uh, the, the groups are working hard to get things in place uh, for the transitions here, and hopefully we'll be able to start contracting with networks and also uh, funders here uh, starting in the summer. And if you want more information, just uh, go here. We're also looking for an executive director. So if you're interested, let us know. 
So just in summary, like uh, I think these are things that kind of a checklist that was actually put forward um, a couple of years ago uh, of what's really needed for a learning national health system or a research system. And you know, the idea is just like, how do we engage people and organizations? You know, are we always doing that effectively? A collaboration framework so people are paying it forward doing everyone else's research. Uh, uh, having analysis ready, state, standardized data, but also making sure we protect privacy. Uh, and then ability to embed research in care settings and that we, we do need to remember these things called clinicians are there. Uh, and, uh, and then also making sure that, that we um, do the right things, that there is regulatory oversight, um, but we actually do it in a way that is without unnecessary burdens to getting to administrative simplicity. So I'll stop there and thanks for your time. Thank you very much. Um, I want to ask a question about around the standardized data, common data model. Um, so when we talk about common data model, uh, do you have a systematic way to standardize the rules? Uh, you talked about the lab values, for mm -hmm. example, and you have this many institutions and data coming from there. What's the systematic way to standardize rules for yeah. those? And uh, in relation to that, uh, I'm sure you have a lot of data cleanup jobs. And how are you doing the standardization on that? And standardization are, of what? Uh, with your data cleanup processes. Yeah. And uh, are you storing that uh, criteria so that the researchers, when they come in to pull the data, they know how the data was cleaned up? Right, right. So, um, so, so one of the things is that uh, we, and you can go uh, to um, this, the website and you can go through several hundred pages of specifications of the common data model. I, I usually pull it out to, to help get to sleep at night. But, the, um, but essentially, uh, you can imagine with so many different health systems and also different um, EMR implementations, even if you have Epic at, say, Duke and UNC, you have different implementations of those. Uh, and so really, it's up to the health system in terms of understanding what they have and standardizing it to the, what's the specifications in a common data model. And so that is uh, how that has worked. And there are have been different approaches where, like, some health systems will just say, um, or, or networks, they actually have different purposes that they're trying to meet. So they actually will have um, standardized ways um, for something that is needed for their health system, but also doing it to meet that common data model, but according to common data model specifications. Um, we wind up going through data characterization so we can look to see you know, how well that is standardized. And so one thing you can do is you're able to not only kind of compare with what's expected, what's outliers, and also what's uh, relative to within a network, but also across different networks. But then also, um, when there's a specific study, you know, we usually um, wind up doing additional characterization to say, okay, is, is this really um, what we expect, and 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 is it indeed accurate? We uh, depending on the type of study, then there also may need to be further validation approaches as well. Uh, regarding you know what's the purpose or key questions but if you imagine um, wanting a system that has some fundamental basis for doing that and then doing deeper dives for specific studies that's kind of the approach uh, right now so and in terms of uh, uh, the so-called data cleaning um, uh, the question is uh, would you go and um, data clean everything in healthcare uh, so we're trying to actually use what's most commonly and routinely available for this purpose. Um, but say uh, there's uh, something that would be of interest, and I'll use hardware as an example. Their um, New York Heart Association class is something people uh, consider is important. There are four categories that, one, two, three, four. Um, it's hardly ever uh, documented. And, and so then you try to interpret what that could be like, and that, that's a problem uh, that we'd have for those types of uh, characteristics.
Uh, just a practical question. Um, in terms of this being a resource potentially for secondary data analysis, mm -hmm. can it be viewed that way? And if you could give maybe some examples of how it has been used for that purpose. Yeah, so one thing that um, we'll aim to do is um, uh, as um, studies are completed, you know, uh, embrace the open science principles, so having uh, shareable um, data sets. There are certain situations that that's harder because of the distributed um, network. Um, so where data stays in the health system, and so that is a much harder principle. But for example, adaptable, like you know, we'll have that uh, publicly available. How important is universal consent? That's a topic that I know we've discussed here as an institution, and mm -hmm. be interested to know what Duke is doing and what some of the other nodes are doing. Uh, it, challenges is trying to get people when they have the encounter in the healthcare system to agree for future research so you can access their identifiable data and potentially right. biospecimens. What's been the, the general approach through Cornet to that? Um, so one, I, you know, I'd say it's all over the place right now, like there's um, uh, in different institutions have, I'll just say cultural legacies about this. So, you know, uh, but I think this is something that uh, we want to increasingly standardize. So right now, if you imagine most health institutions, before they can see someone, uh, they actually make them make a patient sign a form that says, I will pay you no matter what, even if my insurance doesn't pay, and I will not sue you either. And so we would like them to also have a form that says, um, I, uh, I, I'm interested in research, and here are three categories, you know, donating my data, um, being contacted, and actually being um, using my samples. And so there are different examples where that's been uh, implemented, and so we want to actually push that uh, forward. Uh, there's also the outside-in approach where there's technology now where essentially patients have direct rights for their data, and we're going to be experimenting with those platforms. And examples... Uh, 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 an application called Hugo or things like that, where um, you can actually tie into health systems and be able to, uh, and as individuals, uh, agree to donate your data in different areas. So, uh, so I have a question uh, according to the clinicians involved in this research. I know like there's a clinical guideline for the doctor to make their decision, but then since this is uh, like a group research, you have 13 groups participate in this network. So I'm guessing there will be some very, uh, like a variance within like each doctor's judgment uh, during the research. How do you address that problem? Yeah, I, Thank you. yeah so, uh, yeah, so there are two things to think about. One is I actually very recent practice could actually be exploited to understand what's the um, best results. And so uh, you know, we've done a lot of work in terms of outside of Precorna, but exploiting that to understand, you know, are, you know, as different health systems or clusters of clinicians, if they actually uh, have different practice patterns that are more uniform and does that, you know, associate with um, different or better results. So that's one attribute that can be taken care of. Now, um, there are examples where um, in, in certain areas where uh, clinicians have decided, well, we're going to standardize our assessment of XYZ condition. And so we actually, I mean, I actually think of um, rheumatology is a great example where there's often incredibly complex diseases, but a group of clinicians that are really smart saying, like, for us to learn, we just need to agree that we're going to collect the same information and um, have different um, um, standard protocols for conditions. And that way we can learn to see is it better or less than, than a better or worse than before. Uh, that's happened in ulcerative colitis where a group of clinicians essentially were standardizing their approach and they could show that their uh, remission rates um, improved over time. So. so, like everybody, sorry. So, like everybody, every uh, clinician involved in this network, they were kind of like constantly meeting with each other? Uh, well, there are um, actually hundreds of thousands of clinicians here. So, like that would be, you know, it, it'd be harder than getting Congress to uh, agree. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, but in, in certain areas, you can certainly do that. But uh, and that would be it would take in, um, clinical champions to to do that. So, 
in certain areas that's definitely possible but i'll just use cardiology as an example like we can't even get 70 cardiologists at duke to agree what chest pain is yeah. so thank you mm -hmm. uh, no, I, we, we need this for the recording thanks um, I was wondering, in thinking about leveraging this network for health disparities research, um, it strikes me that the systems that may be the most likely to sign up the fastest would be those that have largely insured populations and patient portals where patients are a little more savvy around going in and looking up their own information. And so I was wondering if you have a sense for what proportion of patients within this network are either of low SES status or uninsured? Uh, so I don't have that answer, but um, uh, in terms of that, that's a great uh, question. So, and we actually have a, uh, what we call a collaborative research group. There are um, 11 of these groups that are focused in different areas uh, to catalyze use of the network. So cancer, cardiology, et cetera. And one is on health disparities. And so just understanding that basic fundamentals is, is key. Uh, we actually think that um, this offers an opportunity um, for um, addressing those issues for two reasons. Uh, one is you know, most of the data that's are around um, populations that are underserved aren't in, say, uh, the optims of the world um, by the very nature. Uh, the, the second thing is that the, the network actually covers every state and then covers um, every in regions that particularly have uh, challenges there. So uh, Louisiana is an example uh, for that. There's one of the networks called Advance uh, that's actually made up of safety net uh, uh, clinics. And so that's a kind of a key orientation for them. And so they're actually doing some projects across the, the network. So we, we think it's actually um, ripe for that um, type of research. The other thing that we're trying to garner, we'll see if this is successful, is that um, you know, the coordinate and then PCRF is by intent or by design is going to be um, uh, used by multiple stakeholders and also funded by multiple stakeholders. So it won't necessarily just be on NIH. An industry is a, a good example of that. And if you ask industry leaders, do they care about health disparities? They all raise their hand. And then you ask them, uh, do they fund any health disparities research? They all put their hands down. And so we're going to try to um, uh, change that. Thank you, Dr. Hernandez.